And today I'm going to be talking about making keyboards with closure. Uh, I apologize if anybody was misled by the title. Hopefully everybody read the abstract and knew that this was going to be about keyboards and <laughs> not about type theory. I promise you'll get your fill of type theory in the next talk. Um, but you're here, so enjoy it. All right, so this is a true story. This is a bit of a cautionary tale. Um, I'm a little concerned about presenting it to the closure community, and I know there are some of the luminaries of the, the closure community out here. Um, I'm afraid that if you see this, you'll start making your own keyboards, and I will have done some permanent damage to the closure ecosystem. So please don't consider me the one who jumped on the productivity grenade um, and <laughs> saved you all from this fate. It's very brave of me. Um, all right, so we're going to talk about keyboards, and the, the way that I'm going to structure this talk is first, like good closurists, we're going to talk about the history of keyboards um, and typewriters and other things. Uh, then I'm going to talk a little bit about 3D modeling with closure, and then finish up by talking about using those 3D modeling tools to actually make a keyboard, and we're going to run through that really quickly here. All right. So an abbreviated history of funky typewriters and keyboards. So I tried to figure out what would be appropriate, to where to start when talking about keyboards. Obviously, they're influenced by the typewriters that preceded them. But typewriters were heavily influenced by the printing press and by the telegraph. And pretty much any machine that required text input uh, had to think about this problem in some way. And the first typewriter was from 1575 and had been invented many times by, by lots of diff different individuals. But where I'm going to start the story is in the mid-1800s, uh, 1868, when the first thing that was called a typewriter was invented. This is a, a picture from the patent from 1868, uh, the Scholes, Glidden, and Sewell typewriter. And it's, it's kind of interesting to just look at this picture. Um, the first thing that jumps out at me is that it looks like a piano. And that makes a lot of sense when you think about what a piano is, that it's this machine where humans are inputting sequences of symbols uh, rapidly. And the piano had, hasn't been around forever. It was, had been around for 150 years at this point, And already, like, humans had demonstrated that they are awesome at using this thing. It's a great form factor. So it's a natural thing for them to copy. Um, they tried to get people to use it to, to some success, but there were other people who were also trying to invent something that would solve this problem. And what looked very promising uh, was the Hansen writing ball. This came out in 1870, and it looks, it looks nuts. It's beautiful. Um, <laughs> this was actually the first commercially produced typewriter. And there were about 10,000 of them made, and people loved it. I consider this to be like the lisp of typewriters. Um, <laughs> it, hopefully it's not too much of a stretch, but you, you can even like see the parens everywhere. Um, so it had, uh, not only did it have a lot of fans, but people were very fast with it. They had typing competitions where they tried out different machines and people just rocked with this thing. And you can, you can see it has this, contoured layout, uh, and what looks kind of alien to us as far as how the, the letters are arranged, but it was arranged very logically based off of English. And uh, you got the vowels there on the left. It, it looks nice. It's, it's just, it makes sense. Uh, the biggest fan of this, um, or the most famous fan, is, is Nietzsche, who used it when his vision started to fail. He composed over 80 documents on it, including a poem about the Hansen writing ball, written on the Hansen writing ball, um, I would include it here, but it's actually a little dirty. Um, <laughs> so look it up afterwards. It, yeah, it, it's, it's more of a limerick. Um, so they made a lot of these, and uh, even though there were about 10,000 made, it's a ridiculous collector's item now. Uh, they go for auction, like several hundred thousand dollars. If you find one in your attic, um, know what you've got. But it ended up losing. Um, to 
a Scholes and Glidden design. So Scholes and Glidden kept working on their design and they, they found something that worked pretty well, but they struggled a lot with manufacturing it. They made about 15 of them uh, before they sold their patent and the design to Remington and Sons. You know, this is Remington, the, the gun uh, manufacturer, who had a lot of expertise in manufacturing precision mechanical things at scale. They also had a huge distribution channel and a sales force and they dominated the market because of all of those things, not because of superior design. People were slower with it. Um, and this thing just took off. So this was the Remington number one. The Remington number two introduced the shift key, uppercase and lowercase letters. It was a big innovation. Um, the Remington number nine, just as a little factoid, uh, had a beautiful typeface, and the font that I used throughout this presentation is a, a replica of the Remington number nine's font. Um, and we live with this typewriter today, basically. So it had, if you were to sit in front of this, it would be very comfortable for you, uh, as a matter of speaking, um, because it has the four, these four rows, it had the QWERTY layout, and it looks just like what you have in front of you. And there's a lot of legacy uh, that we live with today because of this thing. So the way that it would work is each of these keys were, uh, attached to a bar that would go back and was attached to this arm that would swing and strike an ink ribbon and make an imprint on the paper. And those bars had to not collide with each other. There were just some physical restrictions on the design of this thing. So that's why the, the columns are not perfectly aligned and um, because those bars would hit each other. So we live with that today. Anybody who's working on their computer right now, uh, writing important closure code, I'm sure, uh, can look at their keyboard and see that none of the keys align in perfect columns, even though our fingers move just in these linear arcs. Uh, another classic fact uh, is that these arms would swing up, and if two of them were too close to each other and used in succession, they would catch each other. Here we have a picture of a sad, broken typewriter uh, where it's jammed because somebody pressed two letters. Uh, and one of the innovations of, of Scholl's was the QWERTY layout, which was designed not to slow us down, as some people might say, but to uh, avoid the use of adjacent letters um, in, when typing, to avoid this problem as much as possible. So the QWERTY layout, we no longer have that, that, that problem of these arms hitting, but we still use it, um, so more legacy. And things really didn't change much for a long time. Even the IBM Selectric, which was one of the most innovative, one of the biggest innovations in typewriters, came out like 60 plus years later, or even more, um, and had all, super cool design. So many great things about this that made it much more reliable. People were able to type faster. But the actual human part didn't change. Like the thing that you sit, that you actually put your fingers on and, and type on uh, was still this QWERTY layout. And the IBM Selectric is, is, there's a reason that I call it out, which is that it was converted for use with the IBM System 360. And this was actually used as a terminal on some mainframe machines. Uh, the IBM 2741 a few years later was a terminal that people would use. And it, you could see that it's got this little ball here that was one of the innovations is that it had this thing called the type ball that you could replace and it would have different fonts. This one didn't have uppercase and lowercase letters. It just had uppercase and APL symbols. Uh, it's a little hard to see here, but, but each of those keys has a, like a mathematical symbol above it. And people used this for writing APL. We, we kind of laugh at, even when I just said APL, people laughed, right? Like, APL is funny because it's got these crazy symbols. Uh, but when you look at it in the context of the interface that people were using, it actually made a lot of sense. And I think that's kind of an interesting thing to look at is how the, the interface, the physical interface that we use has influenced the programs and languages that, that we use. And we can see more examples of that. Uh, 1974, the ADM 3A is a very important machine because of its keyboard. So here's, here's a look at the keyboard. Can anybody guess what famous software was written on this based off of the keys? VI. Yeah. So VI was, was written on this, on this computer using this keyboard. 
The, the biggest clue is the HJKL that had arrows on it. So that was an obvious design decision. But there are other things hidden here that are, are really interesting to look at. Um, the control key is right there where most of us have caps lock. The escape key, which VI folks are using all the time from what I understand, um, is, is right there. <laughs> and a couple more neat things. There's a colon right there, not on the shifted layer. You're pressing colon all the time. And the last little bit is the tilde key over here that's also on the home key. And this is why our home directories are referred to using tildes. Um, so there's like so much <laughs> history wrapped up in, in this, this one keyboard. Um, it, in the interest of fairness for uh, the editor wars, we'll also look at the Symbolics Space Cadet keyboard, Symbolics Manufactured Lisp Machines. And this keyboard is a, another ridiculous collector's item, probably they go for like $15,000 now, can't get one. Um, this had a lot of influence on the design of Emacs. The bottom row here, we've got hyper, super, meta, and control modifiers. <laughs> All of a sudden, Emacs makes sense. Like, um, you have physical keys for each of them. Each of the keys also, in addition to doing uppercase and lowercase letters, uh, has math symbols and Greek letters. The Greek letters are, are on the front, and there are modifiers um, for getting to the top symbol or to the Greek symbol and then shift for getting uppercase and lowercase. So this is influential on the, the, the Lisp world and the design of Emacs. And all of these are really interesting keyboards, but none of them are changing where you put your hands and how you interface with it. They're all QWERTY, they're, they're all pretty much the same typewriter from 100 plus years ago. Where we start to see something interesting happen is 1977. Uh, this woman, Lillian Malt, who ran a secretarial training school for over 20 years and taught lots of people to type, designed this keyboard, the Maltron keyboard. And this was very forward thinking. A lot of the design decisions that she made here are the standards for ergonomic keyboards today. Uh, few worth pointing out, the biggest one in my mind is the thumb cluster, actually making use of our strongest digits. Um, and this will, I pr this will save you from Emacs pinky. Like, you, sh you should consider something like this. Uh, but also the keys, where all the letters are, are in these split key wells, allowing you to keep your arms straight out at shoulder width. Uh, they're angled. Um, ulnar rotation is a thing that you want to uh, avoid. And then the actual keys are uh, in an arc along the columns and along the rows, and they're also at different heights to match the different resting heights of your fingers. If you look at them, you'll see that they're, they're not flat. I mean, maybe they will look flat because you've been conditioned to that from being in front of a computer your whole life. Um, but it shouldn't be that way. You're hurting yourself. This thing was awesome. Uh, one other thing that's not captured by this picture is that she invented a new layout. Uh, they had the E key under the thumb. I mean, it was radically different, but optimized for typing English. And it never really caught on, which is kind of sad. Uh, they eventually released a, a QWERTY layout. They, they compromised, compromised their ideals. Um, one, one bit that I want to call out about Maltron that I think is really noteworthy is that they only have five models of their keyboard, and three of them are for people with uh, limb differences or limited mobility. So they have a left hand, right hand, and no hand version, uh, which is really awesome. You don't really think about accessibility for hardware that often, and they were think they've been thinking about it for a long time and actually delivering on that. It's very expensive uh, to buy these, probably because it's being paid for by insurance, but um, it, they're there, you can get them on eBay. These were really difficult to manufacture and uh, never really caught on, they're super expensive, until the Kinesis company came out with uh, their keyboard 15 years later, where they copied a lot of the design of the Maltron uh, they had a, a bunch of innovations, but the biggest being that they figured out how to make it cheaply for like half the price and 
at greater quantities. I use one of these, it saved my hands. Um, I recommend checking it out. I'm not a doctor, don't sue me, but you, sh you, should, you should look at this, especially if you have Emacs pinky. And there have been other things that I'm not gonna get into, but today there are, there's this confluence of factors that have caused this explosion of keyboards. So there's this thing called the Teensy. For $15, you can get a controller for a keyboard, and it's, really, it's relatively simple to make your own keyboard now. There are these communities, Geek Hack and Disk Authority, where obsessed people get together and talk about making keyboards and all sorts of keyboard trivia and details. Um, there's the whole maker movement. There, you can get your own router in your garage or a 3D printer, and that allows you to make things. And a lot of the components have become much, much much cheaper. Um, people then, all these things came together to this one very important project, the Ergodox. Any Ergodox users here? A few hands, three hands. Um, which is this open source keyboard, split hand. It's got a lot of the great properties, but it's not contoured, which is a problem um, for me. And this is not available for purchase. You can only buy a kit. So this company, MassDrop, has sold thousands of these kits, and thousands of people have actually gone through the full process of making their own keyboards. And when you do that, you learn it's actually not that hard to make your own keyboard. This is like a realistic thing um, if, you're, if you're obsessed. Um, <laughs> and there have been a couple great examples of this uh, that have come. There's like this Cambrian explosion from the Ergodox, all these people making new keyboards. Some of you may have heard of the Atreus. It's made by the Clojure community's own Phil Hagelberg, uh, also known as Technomancy, the uh, developer of Line Engine. I don't know if I'm saying that right. Um, and it's this portable ergonomic keyboard that's uh, really cool. And there's the Keyboardio, which is this beautiful thing that takes design and ergonomics to another level that puts the Ergodox to shame. I made an Ergodox, and I decided that I wanted to make my own keyboard for some reason. Um, and I knew that I wanted it to be contoured and have that, th those, those curved key wells. So I figured I'd have to learn how to 3D model. So I got Blender, I watched like four hours of videos and decided it wasn't for me. Like you have to dedicate your life to it. And I've already dedicated my life to closure. So that's why I did what I did. Um, the first thing that I tried though was using OpenSCAD, which is this awesome, open source, totally free 3D modeling language. Uh, they build themselves as the programmer solid 3D CAD modeler. And it's cool, let's look at it for a second. Um, first thing, just to give you like a big what. Um, so A equals zero, echo A, prints five. Echo three, uh, A equals three, echo A, prints five, A equals five. Uh, they justify this in some text by saying that this is how functional programming works. <laughs> and they have a link to the Wikipedia page about functional programming. This is, this is not good um, propaganda for functional programming, in my, in my opinion. Um, we'll, we'll address that. Uh, let's look at some actual open SCAD code. And I didn't want to like cherry pick the, the worst example. So I just went here, examples that ship with it. Example one, they've got this sphere, it's got three cylinders cut out of it. Um, and let's, let's look at the code. So they have functions and modules, which are both functions. Um, functions just return a value, modules don't. And th here's one that does a, a rotate of a cylinder. You can see that it just says rotate, open parens, some params, close parens, and then on the next line there's a cylinder. So that line affects the next line. Mm. Um, <laughs> there are some other smelly things. Um, here's one sphere, r equals some function of size. You don't see size defined anywhere here. Size is defined afterwards um, because <laughs> functional, functional programming. Um, <laughs> and and there, are, there are some other warts, which I will call out here. Um, the biggest to me, though, was that shapes aren't actual first-class things in this language. All the shape functions, like cylinder and sphere and whatnot, 
are drawing directives that have the result of creating that shape on the canvas, but you don't get anything back and you can't refer to a shape. You can refer to a function that makes a shape, but because it's not really a functional programming language, you can't like pass a function to something else. So you, there are like higher order things that you can't do in this language because it's not functional and shapes aren't first class. There are no data structures other than what they call vectors. Uh, and you can only put strings and numbers in them. It's not functional, as I've covered. No namespaces, so big projects become kind of unwieldy. Uh, I, I looked, there was a, there was a uh, GitHub issue saying that they wanted, somebody wanted to introduce namespaces. And there was a whole discussion about how this should work. And the last comment was, this requires a lot of thought. This is hard, closed. Um, so, so there's no namespaces, and we already saw some of the unintuitive scoping rules. So closure to the rescue, get some, some lexical healing applied to open SCAD. <laughs> One of my coworkers who was sitting next to me at the time uh, that I started on this had just done this little side project, which was like a, a weekend or two, called SCAD CLJ it's by uh, Matt Farrell who I work with at Two Sigma. I forgot to say that I work at Two Sigma. This has nothing to do with my work. We do use closure though. Um, <laughs> so he made this wrapper for SCAD, for open SCAD that lets you use it from closure. And let's take a look at that now. Um, so I've already got the, everything imported here and we're just gonna look at it from the REPL. Everybody can see that. I hope the font's big enough. Um, so we've got a lot of the same, same functions that we use uh, from SCAD. And let's just make a cube that's, that creates this data structure that can then be used to generate open SCAD code. So all of this is a closure language for 3D modeling that outputs open SCAD code without you having to deal with any of open SCAD's issues. So when you have one of those data structures, you can pass it to this thing called write SCAD and it generates SCAD code. So all that we need to do in order to actually um, use that from SCAD is, is just use closure spit. So I'm gonna spit it. And I've got it open down here, we made a cube. And what's really neat is that open SCAD will watch that file and I can just be doing things from Emacs and not have to touch that other program ever again. Um, just have it open for review. And they were so considerate that they even give you this option to hide the editor. <laughs> and, and, and now we're just treating it as a view into to this um, 3D world. And that's all that it is. And it's really cool. This pattern of calling write SCAD and then spitting it is so common. Um, that's, that is the workflow that I have this other, um, uh, just this little Emacs function uh, that I've bound to hyper super meta three, uh, just control C three, um, that will eval take whatever expression I have and wrap it in write SCAD, wrap that in spit to repl.scad, and um, I don't have to be writing that over and over again. And it's really neat, because I can just come in here and put my cursor at the end of an expression and get it spit out. So let's just look at some things. Um, we're able to use the thread last macro to have things be written in a reasonable order. So we start with the shape and then we start applying transformations instead of having to read it backwards. It's one of the, the best things in Clojure. So I'm just making a cube. I'm going to rotate it and shift it over. And notice that I'm using Java's Pi here. Because it, we're, in, we're on the JVM, we have all of the Java math libraries. We can do all sorts of cool things. Um, we have the whole Java ecosystem available to us, which isn't available within Open SCAD, and you can figure out what your drawing should look like um, using all sorts of neat stuff. And we also have functional programming. So <laughs> uh, 
I'm gonna, here we have all of these different functions that can be applied to a set of shapes. So there's union of shapes, intersection of shapes, difference of shapes, and the convex hull. Uh, I'm gonna just map over that list uh, using map indexed and use the index to, to shift things over. And let's see, we can just put the cursor there and see what that cube looks like, put the cursor here and see what that sphere looks like. And then we can see the union, the intersection, the difference, and the hull in this tweet size code, um, which is the most important metric. <laughs> Uh, we're also able to do some higher order things because we actually can have data structures containing shapes. So we can have a list of shapes, like that's great. We can write this fun like a function here uh, called pair hulls, which takes a list of shapes and for every adjacent pairs of shapes creates the hull between them. So evaluate that. And I'm gonna make a list of shapes, just take this cylinder, I could just show you that cylinder rotate it by some fraction of pi, shift it out by a radius, and then rotate it um, uh, by, some other, by some fraction of two pi. And what that does is it gives me the, this falling um, stone head. And this is actually something that could be used to make a Mobius strip. So let's just apply pair of holes to that. And we get a Mobius strip which you do not want to write in SCAD. <laughs> I don't. Um, let's make it a little, oops, a little nicer. And then we can go 3D print this and put it on our desk. <laughs> um, all right. So all those things that I just showed you, that's the, the full set of tools that I need to actually model a keyboard. Uh, so let's just look really quickly at actually building a keyboard. I hear clapping in the other room, so I'm gonna hurry up. So I'm gonna first make a little hole for the keys to go in. And we'll do that by making one wall, that's gonna be the top wall, another wall, oop. It's going to be the left wall, and then a little side nub that is going to be where um, that kind of catches the switch that gets put into it. And we can put those three things together to get this, and then we can take that and union it with itself, mirrored a few times, and get this. And then we have this nice hole. And if you print this out, you can snap a key in there, a switch in there, and it's very satisfying. Um, and then need to make the actual shape of the keyboard. And this was where it got a little tricky and I tried doing it a few different ways with lots of trigonometry and it was, it, it, was, it got out of hand. Um, <laughs> th that wasn't it. But th eventually I figured out uh, the, the right way to do this was to make a function that takes a column in a row and figures out where to put, and a shape, and figures out where to put that shape. And it does something pretty simple. It just takes the shape, translates it down by some radius, rotates it, and then translates it up by that same radius. So that just gets you the ability to place shapes in a curve. Uh, so we do that in, along the x and along the y um, with some little offset for getting the different finger heights. And we have this awesome key place function. And then we can just apply that using a for loop to make some keyholes. And starting to look like a keyboard. Um, and just to make it easy to test, I've got this other thing for making some fake key caps. We could just union those and that lets us visually inspect it and make sure that they're not hitting each other. Um, and, but we need to figure out how to connect all of these together. And this was a little tricky and what I eventually realized was that I could just put this little web post, a little, a little post at each corner, and do the hull between the corners of adjacent uh, keyholes. So I make a, a tri what I call triangle holes. It's the same thing that we saw, the pairwise holes, only this time we're partitioning three instead of two. 
And then we get this connectors, which take a sec to render, because holes are a little expensive. And we can put those all together and get a the part where um, the, the main part where most of the letters are going to be. So one thing that was a pleasant surprise to me was that how this is parameterized. So when I look at open SCAD code and parameterized models, a lot of what you see is just numbers being the things that you can change. Like I want this to be a little, like use a quarter inch screw hole instead of an eighth of an inch screw hole and have it automatically generate the rest of the things, um, generate the rest of the model and have it be right. But what we've parameterized by here is by the placement function. And you can think about that placement function um, as a separate thing outside of the keyboard. That placement function is just a deformation of a plane. So it takes an XY coordinate and gives you a new XYZ coordinate. And you can just apply that to a bunch of points to see how the plane has been deformed. Um, and it's only specified in one place. So you can come up with weird shapes and generate a keyboard that has that weird shape. You can have a sinusoidal keyboard if you'd like, and this model just works. Uh, you just replace it in one spot, which was a pleasant surprise to me. It made me very happy to see that. So we've got this one function for defining where the, the main keys go. We've got a separate one that does the similar thing for the thumbs. We just use holes to connect up posts to stitch them together. Um, and it gets big. Um, I'm not going to show the whole thing. But here, you can render it. It's going to take a second. And we've got enough that we could print this out and start typing on it, um, which is pretty awesome. So to actually make this thing, I uh, need to 3D print it. I at first was using the MakerBot replicator. This is an old model. I was using a, a rescued one. Um, it worked for a while. These things, uh, it's very aspirational that it's called the replicator. Um, <laughs> when <laughs> in reality it becomes very, you have, you have to wrestle with the machine a lot. Fortunately, there's this company called Shapeways, which is a professional 3D printer. You can just send them the file that, that gets generated by OpenSCAD and they will send you back the thing that you wanted. Um, here are a couple of my early prints. One awesome thing about them is that they have a wide variety of materials, including steel. They will 3D print steel using magic. <laughs> Um, as, as far as I know, this is the first time that closure code has been reified in steel. Um, and, uh, I've brought that if anybody wants to see it. <laughs> um, and I've been making this keyboard. I needed to wire it all up. So when people make their own keyboards, they usually just use a ton of wires and have everything be connected up because you can't make your own circuit board very easily. And this is especially hard because it needs to be flexible to adapt to the curves. That was one of the things that Maltron struggled with. Um, so I've been making flexible PCBs in my garage. Turns out you can do this um, with just vinegar and, um, and hydrogen peroxide. That will dissolve copper <laughs> in a laser printer and then you're good to go and you can start manufacturing these circuit boards. So We've got this, got it all wired up, and uh, here's the latest version printed from Shapeways with a bunch of components in it. I brought it with me if anybody wants to see. And here's the glamour shot. <laughs> uh, and it feels good. I've been actually using it. I have a wired up one at home, and development of this keyboard is now fully bootstrapped. All future development of the keyboard is done on the keyboard itself. <laughs> Uh, and uh, yeah, so that's the keyboard. Con some concluding thoughts. Closure is awesome. We all know this, but what was really amazing was that this library, this was written in like a couple days. When you look through it, you can see that it, it's just um, really simple and we're able to get all of the power of closure on top of this other language that is lacking in many ways um, very, very easily. 
Making things is really awesome. It's very satisfying to make physical things. It's not something that I really have spent much time doing. Uh, I recommend you try, try it out. And making physical things in Clojure is super awesome. Uh, it's great to be able to do this from Emacs. No offense, or VI, if that's your thing. Um, all right, so if you'd like to know more, I tweet about this regularly. I've got a repo up um, on GitHub with an older version. I'm going to be posting a, a new version uh, shortly uh, so you, that you can print yourself. And I've also put the model up for sale at cost uh, on Shapeways. If anybody is brave enough and wants to try it out, I will help you get some, some of these circuit boards and you can, you can stop being productive. <laughs> All right, thanks.